Hello, welcome to this talk about container root file systems in production. I'm Claudia, this is Tiago, and we both work at Pivotal on an open source platform as a service called Cloud Foundry. Um, so about a year ago, Cloud Foundry decided to create a team dedicated to providing the backing root file system for its containers. So in this talk, we're going to walk you through how we came to work with the file systems that Cloud Foundry containers use today. Uh, this is a quick summary of what we're going to talk to you about. First, we are going to go through a quick glossary of terms who have, for people who have less familiarity with Linux file systems. Then we will give a quick overview of Cloud Foundry for those who are less familiar with it, describing specifically the application runtime components, so which bits run your app in the cloud and how Cloud Foundry does that successfully. Then we are going to go through each implementation and file system which has been used in Cloud Foundry containers since the project began. For each, we will explain why the file system was chosen, how we worked with it or around it, and why we decided to abandon it for another. And at the end, hopefully, we will have time for a few questions, but it is lunch, so we're not going to hang around forever. <laughs> All right, so let's start with what is a file system. There are a couple of meanings associated with this term. The first is that it is the directory hierarchy used to organize files on a system. On Linux, the start of this tree is forward slash root, in which there are subdirectories and then further subdirectories and so on. Another meaning, the other meaning, is the type of file system. So how the storage of data is organized on disk within that hierarchy. Different types of file system have their own set of rules for controlling the allocation of disk space to files and for associating each file's metadata. For large scale systems, making the right file system choice for both the host and the containers running on it is very important. The wrong file system type can have a very noticeable effect on performance. Each one brings its own set of tools and tricks for managing data, and these can re react in sometimes unpredictable ways under load. So being prepared to face the risks and ready to adapt is key. Next, what is a root file system? So a rootfs is the file system contained on the same disk in which the root directory is located. It is onto this file system that all other file systems are logically attached or mounted as needed at startup. The rootfs context and directory structure, so the first meaning, will vary with each operating system. The type of file system running and controlling the allocation of data of this rootfs hierarchy will vary depending on how the system was provisioned and what the operator needs. CF needs to provide both the correct rootfs structure and the correct file system type to manage data within that structure for every container. So when we talk about the rootfs used to back application containers, we mean both. But the main focus in this talk will be the mechanism, the file system type, by which CF controls data and manages resources. All right, so that's the glossary. Now Tiago is going to explain Cloud Foundry and why getting file systems right is so important to us. Uh, cool. Well, yeah. uh, so just just short introduction uh, about Cloud Foundry, so it can give you a better understanding like of the context of the projects we're talking and the, the challenge we, we're facing. Uh, Cloud Foundry is an open source platform as a service. Uh, it was released around 2011. Uh, it's, a, it's a big microservice uh, project, so it has dozens of repositories. It's mostly written in Go. And today, Cloud Foundry supports both BuildPacks applications and Docker image applications, uh, running you know, these applications as a container in its own runtime. Uh, so, Initially, Cloud Foundry only supported build packs, right? So what what's build packs really really are? So build packs is like a set of scripts uh, that provide framework uh, framework and runtime support for your application. So every time you push an application uh, into Cloud Foundry, a build pack will execute and, and produce uh, an output. They are usually uh, language specific. Uh, just to give uh, a better illustration here. So every time you push your code. Cloud Foundry will create a new container based in a known rootfs. Uh, inside the container, it's going to put the build pack and application code, and then execute the build pack. And these pr uh, produce a droplet, right? So the droplet will be, apart from the rootfs, everything that an application needs to run. Uh, and it's, it's an important part of Cloud Foundry because this allows us to scale very fast, and we can even patch the rootfs for security fix uh, without having to recompile the applications. Uh, and what were the, the Cloud Foundry uh, requirements, right? So Cloud Foundry is, from the beginning, uh, a multi-tenant application uh, platform. 
So that means you can have different organizations within the same deployment, uh, completely isolated one from another. Um, of course, the applications running in Cloud Foundry should not interfere with the whole file system. And from the beginning, we always supported application quotas. That means your disk and your memory can be limited per application level. But in this, this talk, we'll be talking more about the, only about like disk quotas, we, which is an important requirement for us. Um, so at that time, what, what was there, right? So the kernel uh, that we were using was the kernel 2.6. And it, it, it lacked a few important features, like, for example, user namespace. That was something that wasn't available. Uh, and containers, they, you wouldn't find like, the same, same way you find today uh, if, you, if you did a Google search, for example. Uh, yes, and this is our first. Uh, yeah, so Cloud Foundry's first container implementation was Warden, and Warden used AUFS to manage its container root file systems. Uh, as Tiago just mentioned, and as all of you probably know, we, at this time we didn't yet have a nice concise word like containers for these isolated resource control environments. But containerization technology was already in play long before Docker hit its stride. Um, Warden was the platform's first simple API, written in Ruby and C, and managed these environments as a daemon. Warden initially used the LXC project, so the Linux containers project, which tied it heavily to Linux. Since Warden relied on only a small subset of LXC functionality, the tooling was then dropped with Warden then implementing only what it needed. But that is containerization in general, and we're here for the file system. So why AUFS? AUFS is a file system type which originally stood for another union file system, but since version 2 has stood for advanced multi-layered multi unification file system. Uh, it was first developed in 2008 and is a complete rewrite of the UnionFS aiming to improve performance and reliability. Like the original UnionFS, it implements a union mount to combine several directories so as to make their contents appear to be under just one single directory. At the time Warden began, there are very few file systems mature enough to be used in the way that CF needed. At this point, every container root file system's base structure and base contents were identical. So mounting each one through AUFS was far more resource efficient than simply using copy. But AUFS was not available in the, main, in the mainline kernel. It had to be patched in from an external module, which led to a huge maintenance overhead. Furthermore, AFS has no native way to enforce user disk quotas, which was essential for a multi-tenant platform. So the original team did what they could to make it work. So here's a fairly crude diagram for, to give you a general idea of how Warden made CF's requirements for scalability and user quotas work. The hosts on which application containers ran were deployed with a tarred Linux root file system somewhere accessible. And so when an app is pushed, this rootFS is untarred and its contents serve as the base read-only layer for each container. Warden then mounted each application instance from this base using AUFS. The resulting thin read-write layer became the isolated root file system for the container. The application code was placed into this layer and the app could run and make changes to its own read-write layer of the rootFS without affecting the base layer and of course, more importantly, the host. As for Cloud Foundry's quota needs, uh, application disk quotas were enforced by UID. Each application quota was run as a different user on the host, with each user having its own resource limits enforced by the system quota control. But of course, things were always changing. Uh, around 2013, 2014, the username space was introduced in newer kernel versions. And with that came a refresh push for security. Also, Docker came along, and now containers were talked about more. But exciting though Docker was, the original team decided against using Docker's implementation of these Linux technologies because of how it tightly couples containerization and UX. So Cloud Foundry has its, very, its own very clear user experience that it needed to comply with. So new project was born. <laughs> yes, so the, the Garden Linux project was created uh, in the, between 2014 and 15. Uh, and so at some point, the team decided to split. Uh, at the, until this point, there was one team handling the API to containerization, and the problem was too big, and the team was too big, and so it was split. So two new projects were created, and this allowed these two new teams to focus more in a specific part of the problem. Uh, the Garden Linux project would be the new uh, container runtime for Cloud Foundry, 
and would replace the Ruby bits of Warden uh, with Go. So Warden originally is like a lot of Ruby and C, and Garden is Go and C now, right? Uh, and a new scheduler was also created, uh, completely redesigned and written in Go, called Diego. Uh, another one of the motivations for the Garden project was also to have a moved platform API. So Garden would be platform agnostic. So you, Garden Linux is the implementation for Linux, for example. And there's, for example, a Garden Windows implementation, which allows you to run Garden on Windows machine and run Windows applications uh, in your Cloud Foundry. Uh, and for, 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 for a while, Garden Linux was running pretty much the same way Warden was running, using the same AUFS backend file system. Uh, but eventually, we had a new feature request, and we had to support Docker images. Right, and this this changed uh, a little bit how things work. Uh, to to start, uh, when we're running build packs, for example, we control the rootfs, right? So we know every file that's going to be running in the container root file system. We we have all the control over this. Well, when you move to Docker, you have to to get a foreign structure that you cannot trust and have to run it. Also, when running uh, build packs, we control which user is running this application. Right? It's always the same user. We know which one it is. But the Docker spec allows you to choose whatever user you want to be running inside your container. Uh, and because this we need to, uh, it, it forces us to, to find new solutions. Right? So for example, for the user problem, we have to start using user namespace. Uh, and, and it's great for security, but it completely breaks the old AFS implementation because now, Instead, when you have a unique UAD to apply quotas to, you now have the same user everywhere and using a different user inside the namespace. Uh, and that's when we start using BarFS, right? So Garden Linux start uh, wrapping the Docker graph driver for handling the, the file systems part of the container creation. And we have to choose a file system that was supported by the driver. Uh, from, from supported file systems, BetterFS uh, was the best one that seemed to work for us. Uh, all the others lacked some kind of or maturity or feature or licensing that we cannot use. Uh, and also, BetterFS had built-in supports for quotas, which for us was perfect. Uh, OK, but at the same time, a lot of things were changing, right? So Garden and Diego were already in production for a while, but they're still new. Uh, we just introduced a new backend file system to, to the whole container runtime uh, part. And we, for the first time, we're moving to a new AS, so we're running on AWS now. And by, by the powers combined of these things, uh, things start getting a bit problematic. Uh, we suffered a huge performance hit. Uh, we made, after, after some investigation, we ended up blaming BetterFS for, for this. Uh, our theory was that the BetterFS garbage collection was starving uh, all the IOPS available in the disk. Uh, and that, this forced us to go into a new solution. So yeah, we roll back to something familiar and safe. And I think within a couple of weeks, the original team was able to get the new old implementation rolled out again. But the plan was obviously not stay on our UFS. We had left it for a reason. Uh, there was still no mainline support and still no native way to control application disk quotas. As Tiago has just said, the old way of doing that on AUFS no longer worked because since user namespaces came along, every container was run by the same user, so we couldn't use a different user per container and then use system quota control to con control those disks. For now, uh, the team, or for the time, uh, the team managed to do so like this. A formatted sparse file fixed to the requested app quota size was attached to a loop device and mounted on top of the AUFS mounted root file system. Uh, so those with, uh, for those with less familiarity, a loop device is really a normal file, which when mounted acts like a block device, so something which has access to actual hardware or disk. An application could therefore not exceed the size enforced by the truncate, because the loop device believes that the size of its backing <coughs> file is the total size of the disk it thinks it is writing to. Um, although this little trick solved the quota problem, 
Uh, it did impose a maximum of 255 loot devices, therefore 255 containers per host, which was not great for CF scalability needs. So that was the state of Garden, when in 2015, RunC was released by the Open Container Initiative. RunC provided a lightweight and demonless way to run containers and gave greater flexibility for broad use cases. This was great news for CF, because by getting Garden to work with RunC, we could have the best of both worlds. We get the best bits of Docker while complying with CF's user experience and way less maintenance overhead. We would also be able to contribute back to the OCI community, which is nice because Cloud Foundry is open source, so we like to, we like to give back. Uh, so yeah, we definitely wanted to be a part of this. Cool, and, and then with RunC, uh, Garden Linux ended up being replaced by Garden RunC. Uh, just a very short introduction on OCI. Uh, so OCI created this container spec which gives you a standard specification for containers, and they also introduced uh, implementation for this, which is Run C. Right. So, uh, Garden Run C. Uh, so, so sometime after Run C was announced, the, the Garden Run C implementation started. Uh, Garden would no longer have to handle the, those old C bits of Warden, like uh, wrapping syscalls and dealing with obscure low-level parts. Uh, most of that, at least. Uh, and instead, it would now just wrap Run C. Uh, which simplifies a lot the work uh, being done. Uh, and as part of Garden Run C, Cloud Foundry was also pushing for more security features. Uh, and the new goal for the team was to run containers in completely rootless mode. Uh, and that means the Garden binary would not run, it would run as an uh, unprivileged user. And that means there's no way now you can have uh, uh, a, create a, a privileged container inside Cloud Foundry. Uh, but we're still using AFS, right? So the, the, the backing start didn't change uh, when we moved to RunC. But it was also getting noticeable that it was a problem for us. Uh, every, every, it was a huge distraction for the team. While they were trying to f push these new security features, you still have to patch AFS and make it work. And it was harder and harder and more time consuming. Uh, and to have an idea, uh, a good, a good part of our support calls were related somehow to AFS. Uh, yeah. Yes, so, uh, and so what happens is between 2015 and 2016, uh, also a little bit after RunC was announced, there, there was an announcement of image spec, which is the specification for a uh, container image. Uh, that was good for Cloud Foundry because we, we would not need to rely on the graph driver. This opened new opportunities for us. And again, the team was big and handling different problems, and we decided to split. So a new team was created just to focus on the file system problem, which is the Garden RootFS team, uh, which we call RootFS. Uh, and it would completely replace uh, the current Garden uh, Linux backend that was still in use for Garden RunC. Uh, and at the same time, uh, this team will have to enable Garden to run rootless, so we need to find a solution that worked without being root, right? And the Garden team could focus also in the same thing, but in the runtime part of the process. So this is where we came in. We're part of the GrootFS team. Um, GrootFS is designed to be a daemonless plugin from which Garden would request a root file system for its containers. The CLI tool can be used independently of Cloud Foundry to create a root file system from either a tarball containing a customized structure or a Docker image, both of which are then mounted and controlled by a file system driver. And Tiago will be de demoing this for you after I'm finished here. Um, because there was this push to get off AUFS, the file system group was initially built around was BetterFS, which I'm sure you're wondering why after the problems we encountered last time. Um, Back then, as Tiago has mentioned, we weren't entirely certain what was causing these performance issues, but we had a really good working theory that it was caused by BetterFS's cleanup process consuming all available IOPS. To ensure it wouldn't happen again, we proved that the original problem found on a 3.16 kernel did not happen again on a 4.4 kernel, and after extensive testing, decided that we were okay to go for it again. Um, the factors that had helped BetterFS progress and mature since the year before were big company investment, and extensive testing in production environments. On top of that, it also had support from Canonical, which meant that Cloud Foundry could have way more confidence in BetterFS as a production-ready file system driver. 
Aside from that stability, the features which had led us to choose BetterFS the first time around were still things that Cloud Foundry really wanted, namely BetterFS's built-in quota support and its ability to be, for the most part, rootless, which could one day be implemented in true unprivileged containers. The other useful feature was BetterFS's snapshotting mechanism, which works extremely well with image layering. So here's an illustration showing the two different ways your application could now be run in Cloud Foundry using Garden plus GrootFS. So as I'm sure a lot of people here know, when you pull a Docker image, it comes down in various tarred layers, which must be unpacked and reassembled in a specific order. Snapshotting provides a simple way to build up each layer upon the previous one without needing to duplicate any files. As many images have layers in common, this is very useful. So with BetterFS, Groot unpacks the base layer and snapshots it. Then on that snapshot, it, that snapshot, it unpacks the next layer, snapshots again, and so on. Finally, the last snapshot ends up being the read-write layer for your container. Well, that's what GrootFS does, provides the thin read-write layer as the final snapshot for your container. So here, on the left, is the build pack root. Here there is only one layer because the rootfs used for buildback containers comes from a single tarred file which is then unpacked and snapshotted to produce the read-write layer into which the application code bundle is placed. On the right is a Docker image-based app in which each layer is untarred and snapshotted in order with the last layer being the application layer. Uh, you'll see here that there is no application code bundle because of course the app is built into the image as the final read-only layer. Oh, but it didn't go as smoothly as we'd hoped. This time, however, we were ready. We had good containers integration, and so we were able to catch uh, performance issues really quickly. We also had a dedicated team, so there was no one wondering who's doing what. It was just us. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out by simply enabling better FS quotas on a file system, there was a serious negative impact on performance. But because Cloud Foundry is a multi-tenanted system and sets resource quotas on every app by default, we didn't really have an option to turn it off. It had to be there. So we had to find yet another way, and we did. Cool. So uh, this this is the current implementation. Uh, it started beginning of this year, right? So we moved to uh, overlay an XFS uh, solution using Groot. Uh, so why 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 did you pick up these two? So overlay we use overlay for layering. So it works a similar way as AFS works, where you can get different folders and mount them together, and they look like one. And you can also apply this uh, read-write layer on top of it. And XFS, we use it just to support, gives quota support for us, right? Uh, and so here, here's just just illustration to show you that the store is, is the, the store is where we write our volumes and our images. It's it's an XFS mount point. And for each image we create, uh, or container rootFS, if you prefer, this will be an individual overlay mount. Uh, Pretty much almost the same. So here, if you, if you look like the, the yellow box is the XFS mount point, which is the store. Inside the store, each container rootFS will have its folder, right? And we apply the quota to this folder. So each application will have its individual quota. Also inside this folder is where we do the mounting of the rootFS uh, using overlay, where we combine all the layers and create these upper tiers where the application write, when the application write files inside containers where those files will be created. Uh, I think here is the yeah. recorded demo of Groot in action. Uh, lost the mouse. Uh, so Groot is like a standalone binary. It's not a daemon. You can use outside Cloud Foundry if you wish. Uh, uh, here's just uh, some commands you can use. So the temp store here is the store path. It's where we write our things. Uh, the important thing here is probably the most important is the volumes folder where all the layers are unpacked and the image folder where the, the containers file systems are created, right? Uh, so here using GrootFS with the overlay XFS driver to create a new container file system uh, based in the Docker BusyBox image. We're going to call this container file system my image. Uh, it takes a while because it needs to download the image. Uh, it is going to output some JSON with some metadata that Garden will use. Uh, but it's not relevant for us here. And if we list the store again, you can see it changed quite a bit. So in the volumes folder now, there's one new directory, which is the layer, because BusyBox has only one layer. And the image folder, the my image uh, container rootFS was created. 
And that's the folder where we apply the quotas on XFS. So if you look inside that folder, there's a rootFS, which will be given to Garden and to run C, to run the container inside. And the diff folder is that read and write layer uh, that I spoke before. So if you try to create another image uh, from the same doc, uh, BusyBox image, it's quicker because volume is already cached. right? Uh, you see there's no duplication of the volumes because it's using the same layer. And if you look inside the image folder, now there are two images created. If we list them, they will look pretty much the same, but they are completely isolated from each other, but they are sharing the same volume using overlay. If you create a file inside one of them, it won't leak to the other. Uh, so here's creating uh, hello my image in the first one. And if you list again, you can see it only shows in the first one. It also shows in the diff folder because that's where the read and write layer is, right? And Yes, so, and, and this is our current line of work. So this is uh, what Cloud Foundry ships today. Uh, we just finished our rootless work, so you can run root without being, being any user in the machine, pretty much. Uh, there's some exceptions. Uh, cool, yeah. And so yeah, uh, that, that's, that's our talk. Um, I, I, I think one of the things we have to bring here is like that nothing's forever. Like as you can see, we change quite a lot, not because we want, but because we had to, right? Uh, you cannot, we can prepare just for something. We cannot prepare for everything, right? So there was no straight line from the beginning to here. Uh, I don't think what we have today will stay like this forever, right? We, we have like S4 quotas to try, have, have more options in, in the table. And if they're better, we, we're going to use it then, right? And also focusing was a big part of our process. So every time we found a problem that was hard to solve, we end up breaking the team and creating, okay, this team will now focus on this. And we end up advancing much quicker when we did this uh, in both directions. <laughs> And cool. Well, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, that's that's it. <laughs>